Hello, good morning everybody. Uh, thank you for coming here today to this colloquium. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker for this week. It is Dr. Jeffrey Heron. Dr. Heron is a global expert in gender studies and literally wrote the book on critical masculinity and the social formation of masculine identities and source of violence against women, children, and within organizations. He is a peer and compatriot among the top scholars in the world in social sciences, specifically around gender. A short Google search will prove this and brings up over 700 publications that he has contributed to with over 28,000 citations. And this number is growing almost daily as you might have heard at the beginning as he is continuously being interviewed by newspapers and other media, as well as writing articles and contributing to books and conferences. Dr. Hearn currently has official postings at three universities. He is a senior professor of gender studies at Örebro University in Sweden, a professor of sociology at the University of Huddersfeld in the UK, and professor emeritus at the Hankin School of Economics in Finland. Apart from this, he is a professor extraordinarius at the University of South Africa and holds an honorary doctorate from Lund University in Sweden. His research has included activism, policy development, and research over many years in Europe and beyond, including long associations with South Africa. His research focuses on gender, sexuality, violence, work, organization, management, and social policy and transnational processes. He is co-managing editor for the Rutledge Advances in Feminist Studies and Intersectionality book series, co-editor for NORMA, the International Journal for Masculinity Studies, co-chair for RINGS, the International Research Association of Institutions of Advanced Gender Studies, and a part of a numerous committees on both global and national areas of gender studies. Please welcome Dr. Jeffrey Hearn. Thank you so much. It's some while to connect the fact of what you might call the more personal agenda and the political agenda connects really, really closely, although you different, use different languages and different jargon, with the academic or theoretical agenda. And I started teaching, uh, including on women's studies, actually, on men and masculinities from around about 84, I think it was. And then I also moved to Finland, 97, which I didn't really plan or expect to, but that's what happened. I met my partner and uh, I moved. And that obviously is a big thing when you move countries. I've also got here Paulin Utonji, I hope it's the correct pronunciation, who's a Beninese philosopher. And he's written a lot about working uh, in the so-called Global South and how there are many ways which the Global South has historically provided information, data, and so on to then be made sense of from the Global North. So he critiques that, as you might imagine, very strongly. And that, I think, is an important thing just to, to raise. OK. Um, yeah, I won't read this out. but. Uh, so you might imagine it's, it's difficult to talk about gender relations without discussing men and masculinities, but actually that's not true. <laughs> there are many people who talk about gender and then they immediately start talking about women and girls, which is of course totally understandable and quite right. But of course, to say the obvious, men and masculinities are also gendered just as much as women. And I've got this thing here, men as subjects and men as objects. What that means is that you can think about men as subjects in actually developing whether it's research, politics or whatever, but also you can think about men as objects as, as being studied. And of course, the relationship of subjects and objects is a major preoccupation of philosophy and social theory. And so there are different positions one can think about. Men and masculinities, which I see as a social category. It's obviously a gendered social category. It's intersectional. It's not essentialized. It means different things in different times and places. And it's often not noticed, even in the social science. The so-called man question in feminism, I mean, these are a couple of quotes from the 1980s um, in the old days. I, don't, I see men as my political enemies. This is from a, um, a British feminist. I don't want to kill them. That's too conservative a solution. I want them to stop being men anymore. Um, one could discuss that for an hour and a half, I'm sure. Uh, another quote from Alice Jardine. We do not, you, that means, sorry, we means feminist and you means men, I think, here, yeah, to mimic us. What we want, I would say, what we need is your work. Yeah, we could also discuss that a long time. These are just provocations, if you like. OK, in uh, so what's often called second wave feminism, but also could be called 50th wave feminism, um, the notion of the person is political is a very important insight. And for a long time, I've actually thought that one should extend this 
to the person who is political is theoretical or is academic as well, and also that this involves work, work of various kinds. I don't just mean digging a hole or making yourself sweaty. I mean work of different kinds, whether it's academic work, whether it's uh, social psychological work, whether it's um, political work and so on. So the personal is work, is political, is theoretical. And these different aspects, actually, as far as I understand, they, they seem more prioritized in different arenas. So the personal is in, is in one's personal life. You know, work may be in university or it might be in a factory. It might be in a bus queue. The political is in political arenas and the theoretical, again, is in, say, academic research context, particularly. But all the, all the, <laughs> the four elements are also in all the others. So it's like a sort of four-dimensional cube that I think about these things. So when one's doing personal work or personal one's personal life, one's also doing work, one's all, it's also political. When you're doing theory work, if you like, you're also doing personal work and so on. Um, I don't know if this makes sense, but it's a way of thinking about things for me. And I think it's important, I said put here, speaking personally. So yeah, I mean, I'm speaking, I think, I think I am. <laughs> and, uh, but it's also the idea of not doing that in a way that then sort of re, what so-called re-centers men, if you like, back at the center, because that's what's been going on for millennia, or if that's the correct word, for many, many years. Okay. I think I'll skip that one, actually. Yeah, yeah. When one starts talking about politics, there are obviously a lot of different kinds of politics, and I'm going to just talk about a few very briefly. Personal politics, activist politics, policy politics, and then what I would call theoretical politics. Um, this is not to say that I think, you know, academic work is just purely political in a simple sense, but I think one has to think about academic work within a political context and having numerous political aspects. There are many other kinds of politics one could think about. I don't know, sporting politics, spiritual politics. I don't know, I could go on. But just to spend a little moment on personal activist politics. Um, what's often called men's activism or men's movements or a term that we've used with a colleague, Lynn Egerberry Holmgren in Sweden is gender conscious activity. I mean, there are many different versions of this. I mean, if you if you look down to the the last <laughs> the last uh, point in this list here, unnamed. I mean, you could you could actually argue that a lot of what goes on in mainstream public life, particularly, you know, is unnamed men's activism, <laughs> like in in national politics, in in big business, should we say, uh, and so on. But it's unnamed. It's not named as men's activism or, or men's movements. When one says men's activism or men's movements then a different set of references tend to come up, you know, anti-sexist, pro-feminist, men for gender equality, gay movements, LGBTI, QA+, um, I won't go through the list, but mythopoetic. And then of course there's men's rights movements or father's rights, which is a bit different. Um, so there are many different ways one could come into this um, politically whether it's thinking about in a more sort of immediate personal sense or in a more sort of group sense or in a more social movement sense. In Finland, where I live, you know, the biggest groupings of what you call, might call men's gender conscious activity are actually religious groupings, actually, um, interestingly, uh, who, who have at least in the past met, so to speak, as men, in inverted commas, whatever that means, um, to discuss their situation. There are also, of course, more composite issue, uh, groupings. There's increasingly, of course, online activism of all sorts of different kinds, some not so progressive, putting it mildly. And of course, there's transnational activism as well, increasingly. Um, there's been a long debate on the positive reasons for men to engage in gender change. Raven Connell, who probably some of you know, maybe even personally in Australia, wrote in 1987 the reasons for particularly heterosexual men this was to detach themselves from patriarchy from defense of patriarchy in terms of the oppressiveness and injustice of gender systems the wish for a better life for women girls other men and one could say other genders as well or further genders in the same year i i did a book wrote a book called the gender of oppression where i actually ended on material reasons for men to change against patriarchy, possibilities of love, emotional support and care for and from men. 
development in relation to work with children, health issues, transforming work under capitalism, avoidance of other men's violence, avoiding nuclear annihilation. These are pretty important things to understand. This is a, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. This is a, this is a, a triangle. I've used it many times in different situations. It, it was developed, as far as I know, initially by Mike Mesner in the US in, the, in 97, um, 23, 24 years ago. It's very simple, um, but quite powerful. It's asking the question, why should men, or why can men, or why might men become interested in gender politics? You could put gender equality, you could put gender studies, if you like, as well. And uh, Mike Mesner you know, uh, says, well, there are three major different angles on this, motivations, if you like, uh, which can be personal again, or they can be very sort of public political. One is looking at so-called the costs of masculinity in the bottom left-hand corner. What are the costs? I mean, one issue might be poor health, uh, and another one might be, you know, feeling threatened by violence from other men, uh, particularly young men in some contexts. That's one motivation. On the bottom right-hand corner, highlighting men's differences, this is saying that like, not all men are the same. And clearly, you know, one might be a person of colour, one might, might be uh, gay, bisexual, one might be, a, you know, a very young man, a very old man, <laughs> uh, and so on. So, I mean, emphasising difference and the, and the neglect of certain differences. I'm really interested in, in age and older age perhaps for obvious reasons, and that is a very, well, it's still a neglected area within studies on men and masculinity, actually, and it's very important, I think. And then there's a kind of stopping men's privilege, a more sort of social justice position, you might say, which is a motiva motivation, or can be a motivation. And Mike Mesner argues that all these three are important and one should do something, so to speak, in the middle. My only comment there is that these different motivations can lead you in different directions, if you, if you like. Um, if you only stick with the costs, the, left, the bottom left-hand corner, and, that, and sort of only get bothered with that, that can, can lead to a so-called men's rights position where, you know, men are, men are, or some men see themselves as basically um, those who suffer most under patriarchy, which can be the case, say, in, in wartime. But anyway, it, it, it's a kind of, that's a very sort of one-sided or one-angled position, follow me. Um, I'm going to mention here Men Engage, um, which I don't know if any of you know about this. Um, it's been going, it's, it's a, a broadly pro-feminist umbrella organisation of women and men and further genders. Um, and it's mainly group members and most of the group members of Men Engage, which is a transnational uh, organisation, are in, the, well there's more in the global south to use that term in better commas than there are in the north. Um, there are national networks. There was a big event in 2014 in New Delhi, relatively nearby to you, I guess. <laughs> um, and there's another big event, which is obviously mainly online, based in Rwanda, happening in mid-November, where I'm going to be speaking as well. If, you don't, if you're not aware of this, I, I strongly recommend checking out. And, uh, they have a lot of materials, resources, information, uh, a lot of also about uh, South Asia as well, actually. Um, so it's partly for, for information, but also as a follow-up, uh, they're calling the event in 10th to the 12th November Ubuntu, which I guess you're aware of, means something around community in an African sense. Um, so I really strongly recommend that as a point of contact. If I just go back to this, sorry, this. Um, and we think about the top of the triangle, the stopping men's privilege, the social justice position. That sounds all great, but actually when one starts thinking about it a bit more, if I now jump back to this, one can find even amongst people, men, women, who might seem to agree on that stopping privilege position politically, whether it's in academia or not, Actually, there are possibly big differences still within the top of that triangle, if you follow me. And again, very simply, this is basically based on work by Judith Lauber, in the, who's a US feminist theorist, scholar, researcher. 
arguing that there are at least three different kinds of positions. Um, I mean, she doesn't make reference back to Mesmer, but to me, it, it's a way of expanding the top of the triangle. It's like another triangle on top of the top of the, tri top of the triangle. <clears throat> so one is a kind of reform position where basically it's the critique against so-called gender imbalance, you know, arguing there should be more women and men in more equal situations in, say, different academic disciplines or different jobs or, and so on, a more sort of balance idea of gender. Uh, which you couldn't critique quite easily in terms it reproduces a binary for, for a start. A second position is what she calls uh, resistance feminism, which is a critique against patriarchy as a kind of societal system. And of course, debates on patriarchy have tended, not always, but tended to be quite nation or society based. You know, so you know, patriarchy in the UK or patriarchy in India, although because I realize India is many countries, as is the UK, uh, it tends to be often geared to a societal frame rather than, should we say, transnational or trans societal. And then a third is more so called rebellious or re re rebellion feminism, a critique uh, against gender categories, which is a much more challenging and, of course, links to various debates in queer theory and so on, and arguing that just as in a sense there's been a long debate about the category of woman or women and women and women there needs to be a debate about what is the category of, of man or men uh, which might seem obvious or it might seem bizarre um, and how that relates to other categories like male and masculinity and so on so that's a, like a third position so you can actually agree being at the top of the triangle to go back to the previous um, PowerPoint, but you can actually get to real strong disagreements around these three different approaches, reform, resistance, rebellion, as I said. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think I'll skip this. This is another triangle looking at the opposite, but I'll leave that. Okay. Um, in terms of what I call theoretical or academic politics, the term that I like is critical studies on men and masculinities. There are other terms uh, that have been used. Um, Within that, and I, I see this as a, I like the word subfield, not field. I like talking about this as a subfield of women and gender studies. It's not like a separate area. Uh, it's quite dangerous, I think, actually, to try and create a separate sort of discipline <laughs> of, in the worst case, men's studies. I mean, most studies are men's studies historically. Um, so I think it's very important to try and think about the location and relation of this subfield of critical style of men and masculinities. It's a bit of a, I always call it CSMM, by the way. And in Erbru, we have a, a, a research group of maybe 40 people. Some are local and some are online all the time. Well, we, we've been meeting for quite a long, long time now um, around these issues every month or so. Um, and we have people in other countries who, who also now, particularly now, um, join online. Okay, so that's like a subfield within gender studies or women's studies. Um, there's been a tendency to focus within this subfield on what I would call the interpersonalization of gender and men. What I mean by that, because it's so obvious that men historically dominate like public spheres like business and, and, and politics in many cases and military and so on. There's been a tendency, perhaps we're saying we should sort of do the opposite and counter that and look at personal life, look at emotional life, sexuality, interpersonal violence, family, friendship, uh, and so on, um, which is fine. Uh, and then that has led to what is sometimes called the ethnographic moment, the, 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 the attempt, this is a term from Ray Wing Connor, to do a lot of different local ethnographies in, in very different parts of the world, saying, you know, what is really going on when you look at, say, young men hanging out on the street in, I don't know, I don't know where should I say? I say, I'm from London. Okay, I say London. And is that the same thing that's going on in Kerala? It might appear to be the same thing, you know, but it might actually be something totally different actually going on. So these are very local ethnographic studies. And then there's been some growing engagement with issues around globalization. And uh, maybe I'll leave the next thing to, in a, to come up to in a minute. And there've been growing influences of, of global debates, decolonial, post-colonial uh, body debates, 
uh, and so on. And of course, there is still this Anglophone domination by people like me. Um, but it's changing, it is changing. There are also a lot of research projects, publications, about 15 specialist journals, book series, and so on. And broadly, this subfield, I would call it, is, tends to be looking at things historically, culturally, relationally, in a materialist way, but that is a very open concept, as you know. In an anti-essentialist way, that's de-reifying gender categories, and both naming men, or naming men as men, as my colleague Jana Hammer used to speak, and also deconstructing. And perhaps I'll say one other thing, going back to this little diagram again. This kind of diagram can also be thought out it thought about in other ways, like why should white people be interested in racism? You know, or why should people with, who are able-bodied be interested in disability? So this is a kind of flexible notion. And to go back to this, this dual, this dual double sort of um, approach uh, of both naming um, men as men, you know, in very specific ways, not just talking about, say, managers or politicians, but or trade union leaders. So. But also, I'm just stopping, that's my little reminder. Um, but actually uh, naming that, but also deconstructing at the same time. I'm well behind time, but that's too bad. Uh, these are some of the features of these studies, critical and explicit focus on men and masculinities, taking feminist, gay, queer, critical centre scholarship on board, looking at men and masculinities as gender, social constructed, reproduced, not just naturally this or one way only, looking at variation across time, history, space, culture, also within societies and also within the, within the life course. What it means to be a man at uh, 17, we say, is somewhat different to what it might mean at 85. And looking at differential relations to gendered power and both the material and discursive constructions and intersections with other social divisions, the whole intersectionality debate, which I guess you're all familiar with in some way. Um, I think I'm going to skip over that, I think. I just want to say one thing. Yeah, the term masculinity or masculinities in the plural has been now become pretty mainstream, really, saying there isn't just one masculinity. There are a lot of different masculinities, and Raven Connell, in Australia, as I said, I've done a huge amount of work looking at different forms of masculinity and what is sometimes called hegemonic masculinity, the form that, in a sense, is the most, that which most legitimates patriarchy, as along with other forms, such as complicit masculinity. In other words, you can be complicit without doing very much <laughs> and reproducing the status quo, or worse, without necessarily being, should you say, overly masculinist. So complicit masculinity, I actually think is very interesting and in some ways more interesting, or at least a bit more subtle, if you like, than uh, hegemonic masculinity. And then of course there are various oppositional subordinated masculinities, say black masculinity, should we say, in some context and so on. Um, Dr. Heron, sorry, just yeah. to interrupt really quickly. Um, yeah. Just for the benefit of, of uh, the other scholars here who may not have as much familiarity with gender studies, yeah, could you sure. quickly define what hegemonic masculinity or these complicit yeah. masculinities this yeah, means? Yeah, I mean, I did it in, yeah, very, <laughs> very quickly. So then. I mean, hegemonic masculinity is a term that actually was developed in the late 70s. Uh, and the first bit of writing that I know that was done by Raymond Connell was actually about schooling and particularly sport. And um, it was then developed much more in the 80s and in a broader way. And there's different definitions. The definition, which if I can sort of roughly recall, is it's, it's that version of masculinity that is, um, you could say it is legitimating patriarchy or legitimating the dominance of men over women, or gender dominance, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be the most, you know, oppressive or brutal or violent masculinity is that which keeps the, 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 the system of gender dominance, to use that term, in place. So actually, it can mean something different, if you say, 
well, I say in India or UK or, or Sweden or Finland, it can mean something different. Um, one of the problems, and this is where I'm, is that the term has then been used in many different ways, <laughs> like many terms. And some people use it interchangeably, interchangeably with sort of dominant masculinity, which is not actually accurate in terms of how it was first developed. I mean, it, it's a neo gramscian term also for those who are interested in that. So it's about the domination of the common sense of gender as well. You know, what we take for granted as being the way men should be and men can do these things in relation to women often. Not always, obviously, in position of dominance. That's a bit of a long rambling answer. I mean, one, one of my, part of my problem here is that it's been very influential, but I've also critiqued it, uh, partly because people use it in such different ways. And some people, I mean, the, some of the early uses of hegemonic masculinity, particularly around schooling and sport, as I mentioned, we're actually talking about how you can think about this sort of taking for granted the digimation of patriarchy actually happening in the body. See what I mean? Like actually the way in which say men or some men may actually stand or take, occupy space or wave their arms like I'm doing. <laughs> you understand? I mean, so some of the early discussions were around that kind of a very embodied notion, but then other late discussions have moved a long way from that into other, you know, like which which forms of masculinity are, are more dominant, you say, in a in a factory uh, or in a political party and so on. So it's a very it's a complex debate, but it's, it's been incredibly influential, actually. It has. And so as I say, some people tend to conflate uh, sort of dominant masculinity or even violent masculinity with hegemony and some, including me, would want to separate them actually. And in fact, one of the reasons I became critical of the term hegemonic masculinity is having done a lot of work on violence, including interviewing men who have been using violence to women. It is not so clear what is the hegemonic here. You know, does doing violence reproduce patriarchy or is sometimes at least doing violence to women or even to children or other men actually very shameful and indicates that the man has lost control you see so violence can be a, an interesting test case a very contradictory case it can be both reinforcing patriarchy but also it can be a situation where at least some individuals then are very shamed by that and of course and, and a few of them are also perhaps not many are actually also punished and uh, imprisoned and since lose out it's a long it's a long argue, it's a long response to your question christopher and we could go i could spend the whole time discussing this but i mean if you're interested in this and if, i should have said earlier on if people are interested in the things i'm rushing through or talking through you're welcome to be in touch and i can send you you know articles and so on pretty easily if, if you specify what it is you're interested in I hope that made some sense. <laughs> um, but it's been a very influential concept, I'll say that. And it's picked up now also in policy as well. Um, I'm gonna mention, yeah, can I, should, should I continue, Christopher? I think so, we're just reaching about uh, half an hour of yes, your talk, guess. so it, yeah, it's up to you. Guess, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, I mean, okay, I'll continue, right? I mean, I think what I'm gonna do is stay with this first part uh, on the sort of studies on men and masculinity, uh, rather than talking much about academia, which was the second question. Although I've mentioned a few things in passing, maybe that comes up in the questions. Um, I thought I'd mention this. I mean, I already mentioned uh, Men Engage, which is a, I mean, it's a, it's an activist organisation, quite large. It's like a, a network, and it has this meeting uh, online in in November, which I recommend. Um, another example, which is quite interesting, I think, is, is called Images, International Men and Gender Equality Survey. I mean, this is something that's been going on for quite a long time in different countries. Um, I'm not sure, I think now over 30, I'm not quite sure, but these were some of the er early um, places where this is a, it's a survey of, of, of um, men and, and some women as well. And the initial grouping, as you can see, was in the outside, the global north, largely at least. 
Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and so on. And they looked at, or have looked at, and again, this a lot of this is online, you can find it, predictors, predictors of men's gender equality, GE is gender equality attitudes, and then how those attitudes predict or don't predict uh, practices, okay? So this is summarizing a lot of material very, very quickly. I mean, predictors of men's gender equality attitudes and in a positive way were across these countries, these seven countries, is it eight countries? Uh, men's own education, okay? Mother's education, very interestingly important, I think. Uh, men's reports, so this is adult men's reports of their father's domestic participation when they were younger, okay, at home. Uh, background, mother alone or joint decision-making parents and not witnessing violence to the mother. So these were things that positively uh, related to um, more gender equality attitudes. And then they looked at how these attitudes are predictors or not of men's gender equality practices, what actually is done. And these then included more domestic participation and childcare involvement less interpersonal violence themselves and something suddenly quoted less sorry more likely to be satisfied with their primary personal relationship their partnership or whatever other arrangement so this is kind of and there's been lots of other studies since using this about 30 that say if you if you search image images and promondo you'll find a lot more on this um i mentioned this this is summarizing an article from 2014 from Oystein Gullberg Holter, who is a Norwegian. Um, he's actually the son of a very famous professor uh, in Norway, who's now sadly dead, his mother. His mother was one of the leading feminists. Um, and he did a study, that, again, that was very global, um, a quantitative study. And cutting long story short, and you can find the article in the Journal of Men and Masculinities, um, he, he basically looked at how men in more gender equal societies actually have more to gain <laughs> than women in, at least in the short term. This might seem odd thing to say. So more gender equality tends to more health and well-being, more happiness, less depression, very important, less death by others, violence, and to an extent, less suicide, less divorce, more sharing of care. And I say, putting it very, simply in one men have more to gain from gender equality which is a sort of direct refutation of those who argue that gender equality has gone too far in inverted commas i mean this article generated a couple of very interesting responses uh, saying well you know this is not the whole story and you know how you measure these things is more complicated uh, but i think it's it, it's it's an interesting angle to think about that actually um in some respects, although it's not like a zero sum, sum game, um, and it's not necessarily even a, what, a so-called win-win situation um, for everybody, th there is in a sense, particularly around health and violence, there's quite a lot to be gained by men, or some men, um, although some men also will lose materially with more equality, which is probably quite right. Um, there are a lot of issues, that, or some issues that have been relatively neglected. I'm going to mention a couple very quickly. One is around aging and aging bodies. One is men at the very top. Studying men at the very top. I mean, you can do it through newspapers. Actually, okay, I mentioned this. A colleague of mine, a friend of mine, David Conson, and I did a, a blog uh, on, um, was it Wednesday? Like, uh, no, Tuesday, I don't know, this week, in what's called The Conversation. We did it basically on, the, on Trump versus Biden. And we used the word ver versus deliberately um, in terms of looking at masculinity, masculinity. Is. So we contrasted Trump's authoritarian masculinity with Biden's more paternalistic masculinity. Anyway, this got picked up by a lot of people, as these things do these days, on, um, through social media and so on. And then actually last night we gave an interview with New York Times. I mean, I don't know whether that will get used at all, you never know. So this is an example where you can study some of these things very easily by looking at television and social media, like images of top politicians. Of course, getting access to men at the top in research terms is very different. I've done quite a bit of work with men at the top in business, but getting access is still a major question. 
Transnational institutions and processes are really important. ICT, information and communication technology, is really an expanding area now. It was neglected at first for quite a long time. Uh, this is a long list of things. Um, Plus, I should say first, yeah, I've been working on this kind of area. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going too fast. I already said that, you know, it's very important to look at the specificities, the local, the ethnographic of what is going on, say, amongst, say, groups of young men talking to each other on street corners. And that's really important. But I think one of the ways in which these studies are going is towards greater engagement with what here is called multiple transnational patriarchal arenas, <laughs> a long, long phrase. Um, and when you start thinking about things in this way, there are so many th studies, and these studies are not just purely academic, as I said at the beginning, they, they have policy implications that are really, really obvious and really necessary, ranging from you know looking at militarism, war, the arms trade, I mean, men and the arms trade, that is a huge question, no, a tragic question. But I don't know of many studies that specifically are looking at men masculinities in the arms trade. I don't. Transnational business corporations, another really, really big area is global finance and the financialization of capital. Um, yeah, and how that works, which I'll come back to in a second. Development, development aid, and how that is structured and who controls that. That's, um, yeah, international sports. <laughs> I mean, that's a huge, huge question. Uh, and there's been some transformations in that in recent years. I mean, there is now much more attention to what are often called women's sports, but that is relatively recently, really. And still, it's a massive area of domination both in terms of actual big business and also men's lives and men's consumption of sport and men's time, men's use of time, actually either doing or watching or uh, yeah, engaging and talking about sport and so on. Sex trade, uh, transnational household movements, biomedicine, reproductive sperm banks, cosmetic surgery, migration, of course refugees, aesthetic movements, religious movements, political movements, transnationally, ICTs, and then the environment, transportation. There's a couple of colleagues, one is Australian and one is Swedish, who have been working together some while, called Martin Holtman and Paul Poulet, who have done quite a lot of work. They, they produced a book called Ecological Masculinities in 2018, and there's another book coming out, edited by them, early next year, which is a collection of maybe 30 chapters that are on environment, transport, water, energy, climate change. Transportation is the biggest area of gender difference between women and men in terms of um, uh, expenditure and sorry, no, in terms of energy use, sorry, not expenditure, in terms of energy use is the biggest area of difference in European studies. Although the difference between women and men gets less as you get richer, if you understand. <laughs> so rich women and men in Europe have more similar transportation and energy consumption, but high, obviously, compared with, say, poor, who are more different in Europe. But this may be different in India. And then, of course, knowledge production theory is also a major area of transnational, dare I say, patriarchal arena, which includes universities. Global economy, yeah, we know about these figures, half the world's worth owned by 1% of the population. Financial sector, much in recent years, so the size of the sector far exceeds perhaps 12-fold the world's GDP. Foreign exchange markets. And these kinds of things are actually, you know, the financial markets are run a lot by men and even young men. I mean, either you, you, either you get thrown out, you know, at, I don't know, 40, or you're successful and then you retire. Um, so it's not men of my age. That men, men of my age might be owning certain parts of the financial markets. Yeah, certainly. But they're not the people doing the actual work in the employment. And of course, a lot of this now is also automated. One estimate was 70% of Wall Street's stock market 
was automated. So the whole automation of the question of who controls that, who controls the algorithms, and so is very, very central. Uh, these are three books that I've done that are on these questions. This is, the first one is a collection with Marina Blagojevich, who died this year really, really tragically, which was on rethinking transnational men. Then there's a book which I did myself called Men of the World, that's a pretty ironic title. And then another book that came out last year with uh, Ernesto Vasquez de la Guia, who's from Peru, and Marina, who then changed her name to Houston which is on unsustainable institutions of men. So not just looking at sustainability in a kind of positive sense, but unsustainability, if you understand, as an angle. So we have chapters on you know, financial markets, on FIFA, the football <laughs> organization, uh, and many, many other things. These are how institutions are not really sustainable. That's that book, okay. Um, how are we doing for time? Christopher, do you want to shut up? Soon? We're, no, it, I mean, this is your talk. We're, we're at 40 minutes now. So okay. uh, according to the schedule, we have about five more. But if you have more, that's OK, too. Yeah, well, I, have, I have a lot more. But no, I'm, I'll talk. Tell me to shut up after five minutes, OK? I'm just going to mention <laughs> okay. no, seriously, do. I'm okay, going to mention okay. three, three things, I think. I think I'm. One is, because um, I, I don't know who's in the, in the audience or the listeners, and it's really kind of strange. I don't know what your interests are really, apart from the most general way. I think one is what I would call the politics of representation. I think it has to be put on the table as well. You know, how does one represent, I mean, how does one give this kind of talk? Um, and thinking also about um, how does one write about these questions? Um, how does one speak about these questions without, as I said earlier on, recentering men? One of the, when I said at the very beginning, these four different elements, the sort of personal, the work, the political and the theoretical, when one's writing, you know, academic writing, one might be thinking about all those three other things at the same time, but it's very hard to write about <laughs> everything at the same time. Um, but it does raise the question of what is an appropriate way of writing. Um, I mean, one way which I've used different points is to use different sort of modes or genres of writing within the same piece. So I might have something that I might literally call memory work, which I'll talk about in a moment briefly, as well as, you know, you know, mainstream statistical analysis or mainstream qualitative um, uh, results. Um, so that's why I wanted to raise that question. This is also relevant to looking at things like book covers. I mentioned about violence. This is, this is a book I did some while ago, 1998, which was interviewing about 70 men around violence uh, directly. I mean, it wasn't only me who interviewed them. I wrote the book. Huh? And what is an appropriate, what's an appropriate cover for a book? Is, you know, I, I really think it's really bad to reproduce violence, you know, when, illustrating violence if you understand you know there are some book covers you know which would be very offensive so this is actually um this is from a finnish artist the picture and the picture i think is called the tree of truth telling i think it's called that okay this is a book this is a really bad title Re revenge pornography it's a really bad title but we decide matthew hall and i decide to use that title after a lot of discussion because it's the term that this is written three or four years ago. That's in popular, popular, you know, cultural discussion. Um, but then we had a big a critique of the title within the book. We wouldn't use that term now. Actually, now it's become so critiqued. One can't use revenge pornography as an appropriate title. One would call something like online abusive images or something like that, or image violation online or something. But. Uh, we had a discussion on that, how, what title to use and then what kind of picture to use. We just used the finger. So the finger is actually the violent, <laughs> abusive part of the body that's being used. Yeah. Um, aging, I'm really interested in aging. Indeed, I think it's very neglected in terms of thinking about men and masculinities. Um, this is a book that is called Men's Stories for a Change. We had a memory, a collective memory work group of which lasted 13 years, where we met twice a year only. I was the second youngest, I think. 
We met twice a year for one day and we wrote, basically. <laughs> we, we wrote memories about being old or getting old or even when we were younger and we published the book. So it's a very different way of working. It's an example of a different methodology, if you like, to say interviewing. If you interview people, you get certain kinds of responses. If you write about getting older twice a year for one day, for 13 years, you get different kind of material. And of course, you get to know other people as well, of course, obviously. These are the things we wrote about. The first so time we- Sorry to interrupt. Yep, that's five minutes. minutes. Yeah, yep. okay. The first time we met, we wrote about a time when you became conscious of your age, which is a very interesting question to write about. We wrote about men's hair quite a lot. We did it twice, intimacy between men, food, sisters, peeing, and so on. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to finish on this, okay? Finish on some, these are the kind of, kind of things that bother me now, okay? I don't know if they will bother you. One is this contradiction between naming, on the one hand, naming men as men, as it's called, and deconstructing the dominant, or decentering. How to do two things at the same time. The second thing is what I would call material discursive approaches, or even put it as one word, <laughs> it's a bit ugly in English. Things should be more materially understood, but also more discursively understood. This is, so when you talk about globalization, that's a discursive construction, but it's obviously a really material thing as well. I'm interested in problematizing gender and sex, and therefore use the term jex. I'm criti I've critiqued hegemonic masculinity and talk about the hegemony of men. That's including how men are constructed as a gender category. Intersectionalities are very important and what I would call transnational patriarchies. And this might seem most bizarre at all. I, I'm interested in the abolition of men. I don't mean kill killing men, it's the last thing I want to do. I'm interested in the abolition of, of men as a social category of power, as a kind of longer term. Projection and all these things are really highly relevant to, uh, yeah, to to academia basically. Yeah, academia. Whether you're talking about everyday practice, whether you're talking about policies in universities, or whether you're talking about actually the you know research theory, writing, academia, study itself, teaching, learning, and all the things that we do or try to do. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, and I'm very interested to hear if you've got some comments or just comments or questions or whatever. Thank and you. also, thank you uh, so much as well, because there's lots of other things I could ramble on about. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it rambling, but I would say yeah, that, no, that uh, I can... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, sorry, Christopher. Yeah, carry on. Well, I can I can vouch for you in the fact that you are very very generous with your time and your resources. Um, I don't know if everybody knows, but. Uh, Dr. Bhavani heard you speak at a, a, an event online maybe two or three months ago, October, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, August or September. You maybe. were one of the keynote speakers and she told me that uh, I should contact you immediately because of your work and how relevant it is to our own research and my PhD topic. Okay. Yeah. And after, after doing so, uh, we had a great conversation for a couple of hours on Skype and you gave me a literal uh, I don't know, treasure trove of resources just in our first meeting. Um, so if yeah, <laughs> I'm still okay, going through them because they're just so yeah. wonderful. No, okay. but I, uh, any other researchers here who are listening who do have an interest in this area, I would encourage you to reach out to Dr. Hearn. We can maybe share your email address at the end of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've got I've got it on the end. I, I, I'll zip through to the end now because these are things I, I these are about academia. I decided to to just leave that. Oops, thank sorry. you again. Yeah, they're, they're, well, here, well, they here they are. Yeah. So these are two. Oh, perfect. These are two email addresses, and also there's this book which I did send, I think, to you early. Not to send to you. I sent the link to. You. There's an open access book that's on academia called the Gender Sensitive University: A Contradiction in Terms, where I have a chapter that relates to these kind of discussions to academia, and that's an open access book. I'm afraid it looks it's yellow. It's not very good, but you can search that and find the book. And the whole book is is interesting came out this year. Yeah, we found, I, I found the book and actually I shared the chapter yeah, with everybody so here. So it was an assignment. Yeah, I understand. Okay. okay. Well, we do have, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions. Okay. Uh, that, that the team here has, has asked. 
-hmm. I can moderate unless, uh, Professor Bhavani, uh, Dr. Sid, do you guys want to say anything before I start asking questions on this list? There's just a lot of uh, comments on the chat. You, I think you should uh, start. He does. Can I see the chat? Can I see the chat? That's the yeah, if you, yeah, if you just click on the chat at the bottom of the screen, yeah, no, it should yeah, come up. I think... Uh, can you see them? Oh, it's not here. That's odd. Okay, don't worry. Maybe someone can read them out in that case. Then. Uh -huh, maybe yeah, I'll here. do that. Uh, no, here they are. They're here. They've moved. Huh. Ah. So the first one is by Dr. Bhavani. Um, and of course... You can skip that because uh, the talk is over and I wrote that earlier, but I think the other ones are, are interesting because they're specific questions. All right, great. So uh, one, the next one in the line is by Devashish, who's one of our new PhD students. In one of the first triangles, where you were talking about yeah. uh, where men are interested in gender politics. The bottom right one is about highlighting differences. Mm. Um, and do you think that it would be interest that it would interest men in gender politics? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If I understand the comment or the question, I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, perhaps the most obvious examples of this are, I mean, part of this sort of very quick story that I tried to tell, you know, it's been the impact certainly from the 1970s of what used to be called gay liberation movement, didn't it actually, and gay scholarship. I mean, that's perhaps the most obvious where, you know, and this is saying that gay scholarship isn't only relevant for gay men, but actually has got something to, to tell for all. Um, that is an example of difference, right? And of course, another obvious example is around race or racialization, I would rather call it. Um, in a sense, a lot of the a lot of the work that's been done has been from you know well white men and global north, and of course then you have a lot of critiques of that. But I mean, this has been going on for a long time, and you know, um, so the impulse to say, well, we're talking about some of these things. That's not the way it works. For say, I gave a talk in South Africa few years ago and someone said well actually this is all very well but that's not actually the way it works for black men in some parts of South Africa which is probably a very accurate comment you know so I mean that, that's another example of an impetus for looking at difference and I do think that the whole approach and that's why I started with uh, Pauline Udonji, 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 yeah, um, mm -hmm. from Benin that the whole it you know I know some people critique the, the idea of post-colonialism, I know, but the whole post-colonial or decolonial movement is fantastically relevant, I think, and important for also deconstructing men. I don't necessarily mean like sort of individually, but deconstructing the assumptions and the knowledge around men. And that is both an issue of difference and also, of course, obviously, of the top of the triangle, so to speak, as well. So I think that these are a couple of examples of the difference impetus or the difference impulse has been very I th yeah i think that's really relevant to our, our theoretical studies um to move into a more practical area i have a couple of questions i think dr sid said it best but it also reflects what abhijit had mentioned as well is are there certain uh levers of change that might be effective in cutting through these complexities for people interested in fostering gender equality because the, the issue itself is is so deep and and like you articulated very well it's it incorporates so many different uh, factors, but are there levers that might cross cut these areas? Uh, Abhijit's question was about affirmative action and placing women at positions of power, yeah. especially at transnational levels. Um, yeah. So would you recommend any practical solutions that can be done in either yeah. policy or at the grassroots? It's a really central question. I mean, it, in a sense, it's, it's asking for like, yes, yeah, not say simple, but direct levers as, as the, mm -hmm. uh, Sid has yeah, said. And I think, yeah, issues around, um, yeah, affirmative action, you know, I mean, all the things that one knows about, you know, w women and girls, education and promotion and, and, and so on, so absolutely central. So what I'm talking about is not, is totally, uh, is meant to be totally in line with that. And, you know, organizations like Men Engage make this very, very, very clear, you know. I think, or try to make it very clear. So all those things, which I mean, what you, you know, UN women. I mean, there was yeah, all the all the work that's being done globally is absolutely essential. Um, in terms of men, 
I mean, people often ask, what's the one thing you think should happen? And I always used to say, well, actually, <laughs> it, things can happen in any situation, actually ranging from, you know, talking to somebody in a, in a bus queue to, um, you know, transforming organisations, you know, universities in, in various ways from the top down or the bottom up. Um, I mean, in terms of universities, because this is the context we have to be in here now, um, and one thing I can send to you, Christopher, or you can circulate, is that this came up very much in, in Örebro University in Sweden um, fairly recently. And so I just put together a, a list of resources. I mean, these are not levers, actually. They're not le levers in that sense. Just resources, very short resources that can be shared. I mean, one page things that can be used mm -hmm. information. Well, in terms of moral and social policy, I mean, I do think the whole question of care in the broadest sense is absolutely central actually whether we're talking about domestic care child care um care for neighbors or, or community or i mean now people talk about people talk about caring masculinities care for the planet i mean i do think that is you can critique the idea of care as being paternalistic as well but I do think the idea of men becoming much, and or boys, and obviously as well, becoming much, much more, if you like, normally involved in care, in the broadest sense, both doing care and caring for, is really necessary. And that can be done, you know, in educational context, it, it can be done in, in job counselling careers, it can, it can be done in domestic situations and of course it gets you into what are the situations in different parts of the world in terms of encouraging or discouraging that um, in terms of you know domestic uh, let's call it shared care and um, images and Promondo have done a lot of work on that I, I'm gonna make no I'll do this at the end but I'm, I'll make a couple of just points on this more generally so I think that is one major lever but it's really tough it's really God. Yeah, I think you're, you're talking a lot about uh, social and cultural change from an internal, um, a very deeply personal perspective, as well as, you know, organizational and structural. Yeah, but I they mean, I, I mean I've worked in social policy. I mean, I talked social policy mm -hmm. for a long, long time. And, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, social policy sometimes is interpreted quite narrowly. I don't know how it is in Kerala, you know, as meaning sort of health and welfare. But, you know, social policy includes anti-violence, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> which mm -hmm. is I mean, it's absolutely fundamental, you know, and um, social policy, well, reform, to use that term, that first term, you remember, from the triangle, uh, is absolutely basic, really, because that includes things like, you know, what do men and boys do at home and education and work? Sorry, I mean, yeah, so a social policy reform is absolutely basic, I think, in these questions. So I've got two more questions that I think we have time for. Okay. Um, one is one is from from Sid directly, and I think okay. it's better that he he asks it. I can try to summarize it, um, but it's more about how uh, uh, Dr. Sid, by the way, he's uh, one of the global experts on studying how teaching and learning happens, especially among infants and no, no, young I, young children. I picked that up. <laughs> Fascinating work. Well, yeah, one um, of the findings that they and Sid, please correct me or stop me if you want to take over. Um, one of the findings is that babies can differentiate between genders and mm -hmm. between people of different, different skin colors mm -hmm. at a very, very, very early age, mm -hmm. um, different from their own or different from their own parents. Um, and these reactions are unlikely to have been influenced by culture simply because they're too young. They're, they're still infants in, in their care of their uh, mother fully. And um, these seem to be fundamental categories that infants can make that they might not necessarily even learn that they're just pre-programmed to have. This is a, a theoretical approach. Um, mm -hmm. Could one take that into account when we're discussing encouraging gender equality, not to abolish these differences, mm -hmm. but to account for and appreciate these, these mm -hmm. differences as mm -hmm. fundamental characteristics of the human condition? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, mean I, I, I don't know that particular work, work in detail that you're referring to by Sid or whoever, I don't. I don't, I mean, I know sort of related work, but not that specifically. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose if that's what you've been finding in some studies, then I suppose the point would be to articulate that and how does that work? I mean, we're talking here about, well, infants, I think was the point the other word that was used. How does that actually then work its way through as young people become a bit older? I mean, in, in Sweden, at least, there's quite a lot of practice around, I'm not quite sure the best way of saying this in English, but a, a sort of non-gendered kindergartens, you know? I mean, it's not denying that there, <laughs> there, are, there are people with different bodies, you know, obviously, it's not denying that, but it's saying that issues of, of let's call it gender equality as a shorthand, uh, you know, aren't something that should be left until, you know, people get to, you know, teenage. So actually there's a lot of work and practice that goes on in that area in some parts of Sweden and elsewhere in the world. So, I mean, if that's what's going on, I think, and then it needs to be articulated and engaged with, yeah. And of course the question then is, how does it relate to possible different valuations of, to use the example, uh, men and women or people of color or white people, I guess is the term that's usually used that take place in those situations, whether it's in kindergarten, kindergarten, is that right, kindergartens, or whether it's at home. That makes sense. I, I think there's a lot of discussion that could happen around nature versus nurture at the, you know, the most superficial level. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of evidence also. <laughs> there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of nurture going on. I mean, the example I tend to most, use, well, if you're interested in violence, do you know what I mean? as I know, I know some of you are, obviously, then the variation in violence, and particularly homicide across different societies, is immense. Like 20 times difference, 30 times difference between different societies. That, that's, not re that's not explained very easily by um, nature. That's true. Well, on that note, which is a, a far more practical and applied we have a, a last question that I'll also combine a couple of people's points. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is reflective of what we find in our villages work. We do a lot of work in villages across India, mostly with below poverty line uh, populations who have limited access to education and other resources uh, for development. Um, and we find that there's, there's a, a complication when it comes to gender, that you have both uh, evidence that men want to protect their place in society and have very strong sense of shame and honor in terms of how they should be acting and how men should act, how women should act, and are, are very protective of those systems, specifically because it's related to their own personal values and moral sense. Now, the other question that is related to this, and maybe we can combine them, is that we've also found that women, particularly older women, are often just as protective of gender norms as mm -hmm. men are. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, how that might be explained in, in all of this uh, discussion of theory. Uh, so sorry, that wasn't really a question, that's, that's part of it. Uh, the other, the, the thing really is, um, what's in it for men? Okay, so the first question was, men are very protective because of their honor and sense of value and, and uh, order. So what would be in it for them to change? You had talked about uh, men realizing the negativity of mm. um, hegemonic masculinities or other dominant forms. And then also understanding that women also reinforce these norms mm. in some cases just as much as men. So can we balance these two and can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is uh, getting beyond my um, knowledge. I mean, obviously I have some knowledge of India, but I've never been to India and, and so on. And um, I mean, and what you're referring to, I suppose I'm, I, I'm, I know about in a more general way, um, and I think there's an issue here between how an individual man might see his own predicament and what he needs to, needs to protect was the word, wasn't it? You use and and, uh, mm -hmm. and Tain, and how that might appear to be the end of the story. Um, perhaps just as you know. A person who works in a very oppressive factory system, you know, wants to keep the wage, wage coming in within capitalism. Do you understand? I mean, so 
you don't want to give that up. So in, in the short term, the horizon of understanding, you know, is what can that person protect mm -hmm. and maintain themselves. But at a more general level, understanding societally, then that may not be the whole story in the longer term. This is a very difficult thing to actually debate, I think, and very, I mean, I wouldn't dare to say what should happen in Kerala <laughs> at all. I've no, but I think there is an issue of like short term understanding of one's own situation as against the more general understanding of how gender might, or gender relations rather, I should say, might be transformed in ways that might actually be more satisfying you know, less, less fearing other men, for instance, you know, I mean, I don't know the situation in, in the villages you're referring to, but in many situations, you know, young men particularly have a lot to possibly fear from other men or from each other, which is not a, not a good experience. Um, that feeling of um, not trusting other men. How that relates to women's situation is even more complex, as you've already said, I think yourself, or the question comment commentators have already said. And um, I can't, again, comment on the particular, I don't think, but at, at, a, at a general, more general level, it's clear, I think, it's, well, I think it's clear, you know, the women also, of course, operate within these systems of dominant gender dominance or patriarchy, if you, if you like the word, I mean, using patriarchy very loosely as a concept. Um, and actually are involved in that maintenance as well in, in many different possible ways. Um, sometimes with, you know, real strong power in families or in communities. Um, Yet still the whole society <laughs> might be very patriarchal or even the community might be very patriarchal um, at the same time. So in a way, I suppose my thinking aloud here somewhat is that again, there's something of a short, a short term benefit in, in a benefit in inverted commas, you know, a short or a shorter term gain for certain individual uh, say, I think you mentioned older women who might be quite powerful in some respects, you know, there might be a short term gain, but actually women more generally might not be gaining or might be losing out in that community or that society. But as I say, I'm, I mean, I cannot comment on the particular um, villages that you, that you talk about. I don't think I can at all. That would be very unwise, but they're, they're my kind of off the cuff reactions. Um, I think those are really there. great insights to be clear. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. Chris, can I add a tiny bit to what uh, Jeff said? Okay, uh, I think that what Jeff was saying uh, is that women have uh, their sphere to protect as well. Mm -hmm. The sphere is often around uh, caring, child rearing, taking care of uh, other people in the family, the extended family, taking care of the animals, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and those, and that's what, those are part of what women have responsibility for. Mm -hmm. And gender equality, you know, in some general sense, might take some of that away from them. They already don't have other things. And now this could be taken away as well. So they defend mm -hmm. what it mm -hmm. is that they're doing uh, in order to maintain that. When I was uh, young and had uh, children, I was very involved in raising my children. Mm -hmm. And I spoke with friends of mine. We're all in our 30s, more or less. And we, were, we would get together and talk. And what we found was is that there was like general agreement that although the women were complaining and they wanted that the men were not involved enough, when the men tried to get involved, the women basically pushed them out, didn't want them there. Uh, they weren't doing the things the way they should be doing things of that nature. And uh, some of the men said, well, this is great. Well, I tried it. It didn't work. I'm a good guy. <laughs> and then 
and I'm off scot free. And then other ones uh, complained and talked about it. In any event, even in middle class um, academic communities, uh, this the same sort of thing goes on. The women saw their major role as uh, raising the family, raising the children, and gender equality stopped there. Helping clean the house. Uh, all the things you do in everyday life, those things were okay. But when it came to something fundamental from uh, the women's point of view, <clears throat> raising the children, that was the place where they felt that that was their domain. And actually uh, were resentful that men were trying to get into the uh, what it was that they saw the role as being. So that's uh, middle class Israel. Uh, my guess is that it's not just there. It's with... Uh, other communities uh, around the world. In any event, if somebody's fighting something, you want, or they're not interested in making these kinds of changes, so it's a good thing to try to figure out what are they, what do they see the stakes as being, what are they trying to protect, and why are they opposed to uh, to whatever change that's being suggested. So, and, and last thing, Jeff, thank you very much for uh, a really, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, a very wide and broad uh, perspective on uh, an area which has gotten an awful lot of attention, of course, not just among academics, but uh, uh, other people as well. So thank you very much for taking time out to be with us, really. Can I make just two very quick last comments? Yes, I, I think uh, on, I, I don't believe any, if there are any other questions or comments from, from our faculty or, or students or something, please uh, raise your hand or somehow else uh, get in touch with me. Uh, Chris, can I just really quick? Um, please. You, uh, Dr. Hearn, you mentioned um, images a couple of times and I've looked through the work that they've done, that Pramundo has done with this, with um, images like and looked at all of their all of their studies and results and stuff um but it's kind of the only really well developed scale i have found looking at um men's perspective on on things like gender-based violence and stuff i'm wondering if um you know of any other resources for that have been developed um to look at transnational men's attitudes on things like violence or perspectives on yeah that would be easier to ask if you could send me an email actually i think i think clearly that it's trans i mean there are a lot of scales of course there are and i mean for example i mean there are you know these masculinity femininity scales and then there are different versions of that i know one was developed by russell loot he spelled l-u-y-t who is a south african but he's now uh, in uk where he specifically developed a sort of scales that were meant to be more compatible with, you know, South African experience rather than, you know, from the U.S. So his work, I think, he's a psychologist as well. His work is quite relevant. And then I'm doing a lot of work also on transnational studies of violence, actually, currently. So if you're interested in that, we used to term regimes of violence actually uh, with colleagues in Sweden, particularly Sophia Strid and others. If you're interested, it'd be easy if you just send me an email. I'll then sure. try and reply. I think I can. I can. I can do that. Thank you so much. Was that so, was that Kripa speaking? Yeah, Sorry, yes, it was. Know. Yes, it was. It was. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Can I ask a couple of things because I guess time has run out. I don't know uh, or soon. I'm not sure. You have a few moments. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Yes. There's one comment here from the name is Abjitit Dillon. Is that correct? Abjit. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, big one. Um, yeah, sorry, the term hegemony of men is meant to be a term to critique, not to promote. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Yeah, because uh, you wrote, uh, wouldn't hegemony of men protect and guard the areas of power rather than accepting a gender neutral power structure? Yeah, it's, it's a term for looking at the critique of that. So it's, it's both, um, it's like a double term which looks at uh, 
you could say hegemonic masculinity, I suppose, but also looks at how men are constituted as well in that process as well. Yeah, if, again, if you're interested in that, uh, Abhijit, sorry, I can't say it, Abhijit, yeah, uh, then send me an email and I'll send you an article immediately. Yeah, it's, meant to, it's, it's a term for critique, not for promotion, sorry. Just as hegemonic masculinity is not a term for promoting that, it's a term for critiquing it. <laughs> That's the point. Thank you, thank you, sir. And then there were two other things I wanted to say. One is that I, I mentioned it much in passing in terms of this question, which relates to the question of, about um, women and men in the, in the villages, actually, uh, and so on. I, I, I think it's important in discussing these questions, both sort of policy-wise and intervention, activism-wise and threat, is that gender equality isn't about necessarily a win-win situation for everybody, certainly not in the short term. You know, because that involves some people actually say losing resources, you know, or, you know, uh, but it's not also, so it's not necessarily win-win for everybody. <laughs> some people like to pretend it is, but it's not, but also it's not a zero sum game. That's also a mistaken, you know, as if there's one pie or one cake that then has to be divided up. That's not the way it is either. So these, both those sort of uh, simple, uh, I don't know, phrases, win-win and zero, zero sum game are both, in my view, wrong. Um, or misguided, you know. And then the other thing I, I wanted to mention, a very useful resource, which might be of interest to you, there was a conference that took place in Estonia, which is very near here, a couple of hours away, um, about a month or so ago now, or more, which uh, was called, the, the, it was the fifth um, International Men and Equal Opportunities sorry, the fifth conference on men and equal opportunities, I-C-M-E-O, that's it. And it was held in Tallinn in Estonia. And if you search for that, you'll find a day and a half of videos, PowerPoints, <laughs> you'll find my 30 page summary report of the whole event with a lot of information. There was one excellent session on environment and climate change and meat eating and food and ecology. There was one different excellent session on online issues, uh, so-called manosphere. I just recommend that as a very easy resource, which is very up-to-date and, and lots of PowerPoints and, and on different issues. And also another very good session on family and childcare as well. And so if you can't find it, just send me an email. But if you search Tallinn 5th, I C M E O. You'll find it hopefully, and the, the you'll find the report and reports there straight away. So it's just an easy resource, which is both academic and policy. It's both. I think I sent this to you, didn't I, Christopher? I think I did. Are you still there, yes, Christopher? Yes. Yeah. I yes. Think, yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, I'm here. I, I think it's just a really easy. Maybe you can find the group uh, chat so that everybody has access to that. I can put it on I the will. chat. Bigger yeah. part. Yeah. I, okay. I Sorry, I'm not using the Please, sir, yeah. I can also, I'll try to put together uh, even a spreadsheet of my own based on what you had shared and, and the notes from this meeting and share that with everybody too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Malini, I think you're trying to speak, but I'm, I'm not sure. No, no, I'm just so glad that we are going to post all of this. And I was going to ask if you would just post Dr. Jeff's uh, email even on the chat so we have easy access to it. And the materials sound great. I'm just, no, nothing I need to say except that's great. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful talk. You're welcome. I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 show my, I'll show my email the last thing, or not that last thing. I, oh, I've, I've lost it now. Hold on. <laughs> I have I have your email. I'll share it with everyone. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so actually, I'm put I'm put on the chat. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I, I'm just being messing around here, as they say. Yeah, I'll put it on the chat. And, and while you're doing that, uh, Dr. Han said, thank, thank you on behalf of Commission Development Center for an Empowerment and Gender Equality. We really want to talk. I really um, I really like the comment that you said that it's not a zero sum game. And uh, can you speak a bit louder, please? I can't hear you. Sorry. I, I really. Uh, um, like the point that you made that it's not a zero sum game and it's not a win win situation. Yeah, and, I think. Yeah. And uh, we will send you uh, our work. Um, we recently published a paper on our take on women's empowerment 
and it kind of reflects the same uh, uh, sentiments. Uh, it's a paper, I think I'll ask Kripa to send it over to you and we'd really like to hear your comments on that paper. I think that's something okay. that Yeah, we're thanks, you. thanks so much. Yeah, I've sent, to, yeah, I'm sorry, I've sent the, on the chat, I put Tallinn Fifth IC MEO. If you just search those words, you'll, it will bring up the site, I think straight away. And then there are two emails there. And uh, yeah, I've also copied the comments and tried to look through. Um, I clarified that one, which about hegemony of men, um, but I'm sure there are others here, which I could put. Yeah, okay. Any other thoughts? I don't know. And um, as a, just again to make the, well, two adverts. One was the, um, this book that you've now got open access to on gender sensitive university, a contradiction in terms, which relates these, all these issues um, to universities and academia and research, which obviously is useful. And the other thing I didn't mention, perhaps I just, well, uh, although I talked briefly about age, I've just finished a book on age called Age at Work with my 83 year old friend, colleague, Wendy Parkin. And that will be out, I guess, end of the year, I think. Um, but that's on age and ageism uh, in organizations, not just workplaces, but also other kinds of organizations, including universities, which are very ageist <laughs> institutions, actually. Okay. And double ageist, because they're ageist like, for younger people and for older people. You understand? Double ageism. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, Christopher? You're in charge, so to speak. Yeah. I guess so. I, I think I'll just reiterate what both Dr. Sid and Dr. Bhavani said is, is thank you so much. Um, even if some of it might have gone over a few of our heads, simply no, because no, it's no, not our no. area of expertise. I think it, it, it starts a conversation that we cannot ignore anymore. Not that we ever did, mm -hmm. but it's something that we will take more seriously. And um, everybody knows, I think, that my PhD topic is specifically on critical masculinity studies in India. So um, I can also be your cheerleader here <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and get people more on board to, to promote this. So thank you again. Um, I hope that people will feel free to reach out to you. And again, I will share the contact, the resources that you gave me previously. I'll just say one thing, Christopher. I mean, if you're working in say like sociology or you know, political science, then some of these things are reasonably obvious. You know what I mean? But I mean, I gave a talk about a couple of weeks ago now, which was for the European molecular biologists. <laughs> It wasn't on molecular biology, because I don't know anything about molecular biology, really. But I mean, you know, this was about molecular biologists working in universities and about how the issues that faced them, particularly women, um, in, you know, their work in universities. So these questions, are, they're also relevant, I think, for thinking about in one's own you know, like discipline or cross-disciplinary context as well. Although it's more, it's more obvious in some disciplines than others, perhaps, you know, I mean, there's some great work on water, for instance, actually, in a masculine instance, for instance. Yeah, you brought up environment and technology already, both of which are, are very important to our field as well. So cool. I yeah. thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, but well, thanks for your, thanks for listening in this very sort of, un <laughs> this sort of unusual technological situation. So I can, um, I can see one or two of you, but not most of you, it's a shame, obviously, yeah. But, uh, Yes, on that, do we say goodbye? I'm not sure. Yeah, do we? I, don't know. I think so. Uh, Dr. Sid. Yeah, just uh, Jeff, something to think about. <clears throat> you yeah. said you haven't yeah. done, done work in uh, India. Um, no, I haven't. There, or certainly in, uh, not in Kerala. There's some no. really interesting people uh, at the uh, Center for Women in <clears throat> Empowerment oh. and Gender Equality. And my guess is that uh, if you would be interested in doing joint work, that you'll surely find people who uh, share that interest. Yeah, I mean, I say I've had my, I've had a lot of really close contacts with people in South Africa. That's been my main sort of, and also to some extent with Turkey actually, in terms of people who are in a, you know other parts of the world from where I live. Um, I have a couple of really good colleagues who I'm in contact with who are in um, in Delhi or New Delhi, uh, Karen Gabriel and PK V. J. Yan, who work on related issues that I've been talking about in relation to India, uh, including, you know, national politics and also issues of online activity in India. So I'm in contact with them, but I have, I've never been to India, you know, and um, 
that's just the way it is, you know, <laughs> and uh, one can't do everything. But uh, South Africa is obviously a very, very interesting, in <laughs> and in some ways, of course, historically, there are some, <laughs> without overstating it, some degree of parallel, thanks to the, the British, um, but also, obviously, un I mean, huge differences as well, obviously, as well. Um, but that's been my main sort of point of contact with the global south on a, on a long-term basis, you know. Right. Um, and that continues. I mean, I'm working with people there pretty regularly, yeah. And, we, and we've written, written together on these questions, particularly around young people, actually, in, in, in South Africa. That's yeah. That's idea of something to think about. So yeah, yeah, you very no, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Yeah, thanks for. Uh, but you're in Israel, aren't you? Is that right? I get Tel Aviv. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Good. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks for everything, everybody, and uh, have a. Well, it's a bit later for you. Yeah, I'm now going to go for a walk because usually <laughs> I go for a walk before breakfast, <laughs> but today it's it's after breakfast. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot, and we'd be in touch with. Uh, yes. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank you again, okay. sir. Have a good day. Thank you, bye -bye. Thank bye -bye. you so much. You're very yes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> In touch. Okay. Bye -bye.